thank you uh, for the opportunity to, I guess I have to thank Dr. Severson for the opportunity to, to present. He was doing great until he turned out he couldn't smell the wine corks that he was uh, popping one night, so he had to bail at the last minute. So what uh, we're talking about today uh, is, as uh, we mentioned, the, uh, is gonna be the technical considerations around some of the various surgical options for treatment of, of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. These are our disclosures. Um, GERD, as everybody knows, is a, is a very common problem. We don't need to belabor that. It affects a huge percentage of the population and has a significant economic impact. E uh, and a reflux surgery of one type or another has played an important role for maybe 70 years in terms of controlling reflux, but it's never adopted widespread um, acceptance, mainly because of the potential side effects that have gone along with it. And, and there are other variety of reasons uh, that have to do with interspecialty rivalries and different perceptions about how this is treated. But that's uh, one of the things that we have seen. Uh, there are more recent therapies, and we've seen those develop largely because of changes in, in uh, number one, the obesity epidemic, number two, the increased rate of esophageal adenocarcinoma, and then some of the new technologies like magnetic sphincter augmentation or TIF um, have spurred reinterest in fundoplication and other surgical options. So in addition to those new technologies, we also want to look at, at maybe there are some things that we can do to tweak the fundoplication, which has been a venerable treatment strategy for many, many years. So still, whatever the surgical option that you have to treat or you have to employ, you still have to adhere to the basic tenets of fundoplication. You have to reduce the hiatus hernia. You have to restore the crural barrier. Uh, you have to, to restore the intra-abdominal esophagus, and you have to address, you have to either uh, augment or rebuild the lower esophageal sphincter. And the question is how to do that. Um, this and uh, fundoplication, and uh, more recently, to pay fundoplication, have been one of the ways that we have addressed that. But there are other uh, options now, which we'll be talking about later in this session, the magnetic sphincter augmentation and the CTIF as well. The Nissen is in trouble. Uh, it has been in trouble for about 25 years, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Most of you may be familiar with a lot of those reasons are. I'm gonna touch on them briefly as we go along, but the bottom line is that we see that there's a, uh, an unfortunate tendency towards dysphagia, gas bloating, and then there are questions about its durability. Um, the persistent PPI use and also reoperation rate of that procedure, and oftentimes those particular problems because of the way that this this is addressed by various specialties. These uh, um, issues oftentimes end up in the gastroenterologist's office, which has helped trash the fundoplication as a viable operative technique. The, neg the Nissen's negative uh, reputation has spurred the rise of the various alternative therapies. Uh, there's a flurry of uh, things that are done to try to restore that reflux barrier without um, resorting to something as quote unquote drastic as a fundoplication. The ones that are gonna be talked about this session, as I mentioned, are gonna be magnetic sphincter augmentation and transural uh, incisional fundoplication. So the reasons for suboptimal outcomes after fundoplication, the, I think that, that largely we're seeing that there is a, a, an adequate preoperative evaluation. Uh, oftentimes we're seeing that uh, some of the uh, preoperative workups are skimpy at best and sometimes absent. Um, we're seeing poor patient procedure selection. Again, the procedure selection oftentimes being based on the um, uh, preoperative workup. And we're seeing suboptimal technique. And, and uh, I think that, that all of us have, that have done this a lot as for gut surgeons have all seen the results of uh, suboptimal technique, hopefully not in our own institutions. The technical considerations as we begin to look at how we're going to tweak the fundoplication and make it into a more effective strategy, uh, we, we're looking at, at partial versus total fundoplication. We're looking at maximal versus minimal dissection, uh, the extent to which we mobilize the esophagus, for example, bougie util utilization, whether we're going to use it at all, or if so, what size are we going to use, division of short gastric vessels to enable uh, mobilization of the fundus to facilitate the wrap, a robotic versus laparoscopic approach, hiatal uh, repair technique, whether you use mesh or pledgets or suture or however you like to do it. Uh, Endoflip, uh, we'll talk briefly about that, uh, although this is a, not a completely mature technology that does not have a robust data set behind it. Uh, it's, uh, is, we have found, we suspect that it is useful, uh, 
in the calibration of the curl approximation and in fact, performing the wrap itself, keep it from getting too tight or too loose. Um, fundification remains the procedure of choice. It is still the gold standard for advanced disease uh, and fundification of one type or another. And we're talking about large parasophageal hernias, uh, the uh, existence of grade C, of recurrence, grade C and grade D erosive esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, shortened esophagus, uh, failed magnetic sphincter augmentation or failed TIFFs. Um, the number one question that uh, if patients are going to employ uh, and are skilled at doing fundoplication, the question I think that they're going to have to answer as they plan the operation is whether or not to do a, a Nissen or a toupee fundoplication if you're committed to fundoplication. Um, the uh, Nissen has, has been, as I said, the gold standard for decades, but uh, there's a lot of myths that are surrounding it as an effective strategy. Um, and so we, Dr. Severson undertook a review of the SAGE's meta-analysis on this to try to uh, determine whether or not these were valid. The uh, uh, committee, the uh, uh, Surgical Guidelines Committee here at SAGES has put together uh, done this meta-analysis, and that, uh, for your information, this, that is listed here, along with the website link. And uh, it's interesting, it's interesting to review. I sat in on the, the uh, consensus committee yesterday and was both surprised, disappointed, and elated uh, all at the same time in the way that that went. Um, I think that the key questions that we have to answer relative to fund application, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> regarding uh, uh, the uh, using uh, fund application versus uh, uh, to pay partial fund application, the key questions are going to be, and the ones that they asked were the fund application versus medical management, um, and I'm not going to address that here, robotic versus laparoscopic fund application, uh, complete versus partial fund application in both adult and pediatrics, and then um, relative to number four, questions about technique, uh, division of short gastrics for mobilization fundus, and the minimal dissection versus maximal dissection. This is probably more applicable to pediatric fund applications, and I'm not going to get too deep into that here. So they looked at uh, 1,473 studies. They found that 105 of those uh, met inclusion criteria. There was a relatively high degree, tendency towards a high degree or uncertain degree of bias in those, and that was the reason for so many being thrown out. The key question number two, when they looked at uh, the uh, robotic versus laparoscopic, they found that there was no difference in outcomes and that robotic was costlier. So no surprise there. We all knew that was going to be the case. Question number four, division of short gastrics versus no division of short gastrics, so-called Rosetti versus a standard Nissen fund application. Again, no difference in outcomes. Uh, the uh, other aspect of this, the dissection uh, at the... Uh, uh, at the hiatus, maximal dissection versus minimal dissection. Um, they found that minimal dissection was associated with a lower operation rate. So that was a little bit of a surprise, but that applies mostly to pediatric patients. Key question number three is where a lot of the meat of this all exists. And uh, they studied, uh, they looked at, uh, of the studies that they found, they found that 43 studies met inclusion criteria, 26 randomized control trials, and 12 cohort studies on that. Uh, and those were pretty good studies for the most part. Uh, from a complication standpoint, and those complica complications were defined on the clavian dindle scale of uh, grades three to five, uh, found that basically there was no difference in terms of, uh, of complications. Symptom control, they found really no difference in both short and long-term um, uh, symptom control of the Nissen versus the toupee fund application. Quality of life based on HRQL scores, again, did not really demonstrate any significant difference at all. We start getting into uh, pH and normalization uh, based on Demeester scores. Really, they found, they, they used 10 randomized control trials that they found were valuable in this. Um, and that really didn't demonstrate any difference between the, the fund application, the pay fund application, relative to acid exposure in the post-operative period. The uh, prolonged proton pump inhibitor use uh, was a little bit more confusing, uh, and I think that that data, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but basically there was no significant difference uh, based on the randomized control trials. Uh, the uh, cohort studies indicated that there might be some prolonged use uh, with partial fund application, and that's a little bit at odds with the uh, 
uh, with the acid exposure data. Long-term dysphagia, um, the, uh, the uh, four observational studies they looked at really didn't demonstrate any difference in that regard. Long-term gas bloat, uh, again, for, that, uh, for the most part, that also demonstrated that there was not a significant difference uh, between the fundal plications, between the partial and the full, uh, complete fundal plication. Reoperation rate, based on 15 randomized controlled trials that they reviewed, did not demonstrate any significant difference there. So it does not appear that the, the Nissen is substantially more durable than the toupee. The uh, endo flip is uh, a, uh, a useful tool. We've used it a lot in our program. Uh, it is, for those that don't know about it much, it is a balloon that's deployed across the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, it allows us, and uh, using uh, impedance planimetry, it allows us to look at balloon pressure, to look at the diameter, and to look at the distensibility index. It, in real time, during an operation, allows us to actually calibrate the curl closure and adjust it, make it tighter or, or looser, uh, and the same thing is true of the wrap itself. Uh, it also allows us, because of the graphical display that it has to actually accurately identify the uh, lower esophageal sphincter so that we can place the wrap, uh, centering it on that lower esophageal sphincter. So in conclusion, I would say that initial fundal plication uh, remains the gold standard to which all the other anti-reflux operations are con uh, compared. Uh, the SAGE's meta-analysis uh, exonerates most of the common misperceptions. Uh, the Nissan really appears to have no advantages over the toupee, and in fact, depending on how you look at the data, uh, there may be less dysphagia and there may be less gas bloat for the toupee, uh, but it certainly is not worse. It depends on your confidence in the data that's presented. That's all I have.